Uh, so let's go to the Lord. Father, as always, it's a joy to be in your word, to be able, Father, to open the pages of this marvelous work of yours and learn your heart, and learn your desires for us, and learn your instructions for us. And particularly in the gospel message, Father, to be able to see how your Son, our Lord, spent his time on earth in preparation for a death he did not deserve. And all the while, Father, preparing men who would eventually bring the message of the gospel to the four corners of the world, even so that we would know it ourselves in this day. Thank you, Father. Let us, as we open the word today, Father, with the power of the Holy Spirit, let us be prepared for what you bring to us. Father, it is uh, so often my tendency, and I would imagine, Father, it's shared by others as well. It's often my tendency, Father, to open the word and to read the pages and to understand the meaning and to put to mind other people for whom it must apply and to consider other people and how they should know what I'm reading. And how easy is it, Father, to forget that it is me, myself, who must learn what's on that page and apply it in my own life, knowing that it is about me, that the correction, Father, is for me and that the instruction is for me. I pray, Lord, that for each of us as we open the Word today, that would be our heart's intent to see what is there for us to know that you have placed it there and revealed it to us specifically so that we might make good use of it. And in uh, knowing it, Father, we might be more like you, having been changed by it. We thank you for that opportunity. Let the words I speak be yours, and let the time we spend together, Father, be in glory to you. And let the body of Christ be built up by our teaching today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, as always, let's open up to Luke. Chapter 9, and today we will pick up where we left off in about verse 43. This week, when we ended our study, hopefully you have a good memory, but I mentioned we had a few things left unresolved out of the text we read last week. Put yourself back in the moment. Jesus just returned from the transfiguration on the mountain. The disciples have seen this. They're walking back with him. As they come back into the town, he heals that demon-possessed Boy, we watched him perform the healing. We watched the fact that the disciples had been unable to do it themselves prior to Jesus stepping in. And we talked last week about how the power of the enemy was on display in the way that the enemy was uh, possessing that young boy and in the way that he's created fear in the crowd that watched that boy. And yet we also noticed how Jesus demonstrated the far, far greater power of God in the ease with which he was able to dismiss this demon enemy in just the matter of a few words. And we ended last week in verse 43, and I only read the first half of verse 43. If you have your Bible open in front of you, or if somebody else has a Bible nearby, just reach out and grab theirs and make them go back and get the ones that we have in the back of the room for visitors. If you look at verse 43, we ended with the statement that the power of God was amazing to the crowd because of the ease with which Jesus was able to contend with this supposedly strong enemy. And I mentioned last week that this miracle was closely connected to the events on the mountain. And here's where we left off. Here's where that loose end went untied. I mentioned last week we have the scene of the transfiguration. Jesus on the mountain, Elijah, Moses on either side of him. He walks down from the mountain and then he kind of comes upon this scene with the boy and he dispenses with the demon. And it really seems very disconnected. It it, it almost seems as though Luke is just wandering from point to point, from account to account. And you expect more from that, obviously, out of God's Word. You expect some kind of thought being tied together by the circumstances. And indeed, there is. We're going to look at this series of passages again, starting with Luke 9.43, and then moving forward from there, so that we can examine the connection. And I'll try to build that for you here this morning. Luke 9.43. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them, so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. We'll end there for just a moment. Let's look at these verses, and let's begin to connect the events we've been studying here in chapter 9. In the midst of this miracle, the text makes clear, even in the moment as the boy is being healed, the crowd continuing to marvel at what God has just done through Christ, Jesus abruptly 
uh, mentions to the disciples, uh, almost in an offhanded way it would seem, by the way, I'm going to be handed over to men. Now, he does introduce this by saying, let these words sink into your ears. That's a colloquial uh, way of saying, pay close attention to what I'm about to say. He says, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of men. When we look at Mark, Mark's account of this same moment mentions that Jesus tells the disciples as he's coming down from the mountain, even before he heals the demonic boy, that men were going to kill him, and on the third day he would be raised up. So take a couple of things now and link them together. He comes down from the mountain. As he's coming down, he tells the disciples, I'm going to have to be put to death, and I'm going to be resurrected. And in Mark's account, as we'll read here in a moment, they're not sure what that means. Then we have him healing this demonic boy, and immediately after that, he returns really to the same topic that he had as he walked down the mountain. He comes right back to this thought of, I'm going to be handed over to men, by the way. Luke says the disciples couldn't understand this statement in the moment, and they were scared, in fact, to ask for any clarification. And as I said, the statement seems to come out of nowhere. So let's break this down. What was Jesus saying? Why did he choose this moment to discuss it? Consider his words, first of all. He says, the Son of Man, which is a messianic term, refers to Christ, referring to himself, will be delivered over to men. In Greek, the, word, uh, the words that Jesus used here have some subtle underlying meaning that we need to understand. He says, I'm going to be handed over. Paradidomai, paradidomai in the Greek. It means literally betrayed. I'm going to be betrayed. Betrayed into the hands of men, we're told. Hands of men, anthropos, anthropos, can also be translated enemy. It, it has a dual meaning, the hands of men or enemy. So it's a double meaning implicit in the text. I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be handed over to men, can also be translated, I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of the enemy. I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of the enemy. Now, which enemy would he be referring to, of course? The enemy in this context has to be Satan himself. So, he's come down from the mountain saying, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to be resurrected. And he dispenses with a demon out of the boy, and then he turns around to the disciples and he says, and by the way, I'm going to be handed over to the very same enemy that you just saw me dispense with so easily. And that enemy is going to have success in so much as I'm going to be put to death. Now, we know exactly what happens when Jesus goes down into Jerusalem. We know the end of the story, of course. He's betrayed by a disciple, by Judas, one of the men, in fact, who are standing in this very moment hearing these words. Now, we also know from Scripture that the instigator for the betrayal, for the persecution, in fact, that followed after the betrayal, was none other than Satan himself. We'll get there at one point, but we know, if you know this gospel story already, you know that Judas himself is indwelt by Satan, and that is the reason why Judas does what he does. So, when he says, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of the enemy, he's prophesying, he's foretelling the fact that Judas would hand him over for death, that the enemy in Judas would be the instigator for doing that. Now, if his meaning here is fairly straightforward, if we can dis dissect the text easily enough and begin to understand what he's saying, understanding why he chose to bring it up in this moment may be a little more difficult. And that's where I want to put some emphasis. To begin, we need to go back a few verses to something I mentioned a moment ago, to where Mark talks about Jesus' conversation with the disciples as he descends the mountain. I'll read a couple verses out of Mark. Mark 9.9. 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. Can you imagine how difficult that would have been for them in the moment, coming down from the transfiguration, assuming that the kingdom had now arrived, having seen it? And Jesus says, now don't tell anybody about this until after I've risen from the dead. What? What does, he, what does he mean by that? And they seize on it, we're told. They discuss it. What does he mean by that phrase? It seems so odd. And naturally, they're, dis, they're startled. Naturally, they're bothered by it. But it's clear. Jesus is already beginning to plant some seeds with the disciples about the fact that he's going to die in Jerusalem when he reaches Jerusalem. And here's the dilemma for Christ, and here's the challenge for the disciples. They need to begin to understand that this rabbi that they are following is going to die, raised from the dead, and that that is a necessity if God is going to establish his kingdom. That is a foregone conclusion for us. It's an easy, relatively easy thing for us to understand now. 
after the fact, but it would have blown the minds of the disciples before it happened. The thought that that had to go the way it went was a radically different thing from what they expected. So as Mark records, Jesus begins slowly to introduce this thought to the disciples. Just a little hint here and there. I've had this experience in a different setting, obviously in a different context in my own life, where my wife is typically the first one in my family who gets any sense from God that it's time to move. We've moved 11 times in our 15, 16 years of marriage, and inevitably, every time a move is right around the corner, I'm in denial, and she's understanding it's happening and about the... She'll start packing the house. She'll literally start packing boxes, and I'm mad at her for packing boxes. Stop that. Cut it out. We're not moving. You know, whatever, whatever. And she's packing boxes. She'll tell you that's exactly what happens. And what God is doing through my wife is speaking probably to me at the same moment, and I'm just too hard-headed. She picks up on it sooner. She starts acting on it sooner. And I think that's how God, in some sense, prepares me for something he's about to do. Through my wife, through her greater sensitivity, perhaps, to his moving in our life, she starts to do these little things that uh, begin to prepare me for the inevitable. I just, you know, I hate to see it. When it starts to happen, I'm like, no, not again. But inevitably, we move. And God, perhaps, through Christ and in his words to the disciples, is doing something very similar here, maybe. He can't just come out with them and say, sit down, let me tell you what's going to happen, without risking them completely going, you know, perplectic over it, just being completely beside themselves with concern and with doubt and with questions. Rather than do that, he starts to ease them into it. I think that's what we're seeing him do here. But it is still strange that both Luke and Mark move directly into the account of the demonic boy following these statements. Both Mark and Luke put the story of the demonic boy right after the transfiguration and before the commentary about, let me tell you, I'm going to be killed in Jerusalem. Which tells me that the event actually occurred in that order, if both accounts capture it that way. So doesn't it seem odd to us that this rather important discussion that Jesus is starting to ease them in on is interrupted by this experience with the demonic boy? You'd, you'd think if it's just another random healing, why don't we just move it and put it where it might better apply and fit in with a bunch of other healings? Well, clearly there has to be a reason why it, it's placed where it is. Look at how this event supports the larger issue being discussed around it. First, remember what the essence of that lesson was. What was the essence of the lesson that Jesus taught through the healing of the boy? We saw last week that Jesus was frustrated for the lack of faith shown by his disciples in the face of one of, his enemies, of, one of the enemy's displays. He was frustrated at the fact that they took so much, uh, they, they, they read so much into what they saw the boy doing. They gave the, the enemy far too much credit for the power he was displaying in this boy. And Christ turns around and chastises both the crowd and the disciples for their lack of faith. We read that last week. And then in the course of healing the boy, Jesus proceeds to display what we've already described, this awesome power of God, and he does it in such a dramatic way that the crowd is amazed. And now look at what he does. In the midst of their celebrating, he turns to them and says, this enemy, the same enemy that I just dispensed with so easily, is going to be the one who's going to gain the upper hand and kill me and orchestrate my death. How absolutely bizarre that must have seemed to the disciples. How, it's a complete contradiction. You so easily dispense with him in this moment and you're telling me at later times he's going to destroy you or the appearance of destruction. How can he in one moment display such matchless power over the enemy and then in the next breath confess that that same enemy is going to have the power to crush him. It makes no sense. And as the text tells us, the disciples couldn't reconcile those contradictory statements. In fact, in verse 45, we're told the statement was concealed from them. In fact, the, the meaning of it was actually withheld. God, by withholding the insight and the understanding given through the Holy Spirit, by withholding that, he intentionally left them in a state of confusion in the moment. Now, this, this gets even more problematic for us, perhaps, because now we have this question in our mind that said, why would God go to the effort to tell the disciples something that he wasn't willing to let them understand? It seems purposeless, right? Why tell somebody something and then purposely prevent them from understanding your words? Well, the answer is Jesus is planting seeds here for another day. A day when the disciples will desperately need this understanding far more than they need it now. In fact, if it were possible for them to fully grasp the truth in this moment, I think it would actually work against Jesus' purpose. If he were to allow them to fully appreciate the meaning of what he just said, 
it's likely that they might have been prompted to try to stop those very events, to intervene, like Peter did earlier when he's, oh, in the Gospels, if you've read, when Peter says to the Lord, far be it, Lord, that you would die. And he says, get behind me, Satan, as we studied. The point being that Jesus wants them to know that it was always the plan that the enemy would be given the opportunity to destroy Christ because that fit into God's larger plan. And they needed to understand that at a time in the future, but to know it now was actually not consistent with God's purpose. One day, though, that understanding, as it eluded them here, will be made known to them by the Holy Spirit. And on that day, it's going to be important because there's going to be a day when they see their Lord crucified, put to death by the efforts of the enemy, and they're going to wonder and they're going to doubt And they're going to question whether he was who he said he was. And they're going to question whether he really has the power to defeat this enemy that they thought could be defeated. And they're going to worry that God's power is not capable of overcoming the enemy's power. And in that doubt, they're going to forget or be tempted to forget everything they were taught. For example, what does Peter do immediately after the crucifixion? Do you know? He goes back to fishing. Remember? He, he essentially walks away from three years of, of teaching under Christ and of ministry preparation. He says, well, I guess that didn't work out. Nice while it lasted. Let's go back to fishing, James. It takes Christ reappearing to him after the resurrection and calling on him to throw his net over the board again, as he did when he first met Peter. And when he pulls in such a huge quantity of fish, he realizes this is Jesus again. And he jumps off the boat and swims back to shore to be with him. You know the story, I hope. That's what Jesus had to begin to prepare them for, even now, with little seeds of understanding, so that when the doubt came at the end, he would be able to pull them back from that doubt and remind them of the fact that, look, I dispensed with the enemy easily enough, but there was a reason in me allowing the enemy to have some control for the time so that he would actually be doing God's bidding in putting me to death, though he didn't realize that's what he was doing. That's part of what Christ is doing, even as he teaches here. At the end of Luke's Gospel, if we were to jump all the way to chapter 24, Christ appears to the disciples and tries to prove to them that he has risen from the dead. Listen to these parting words. We'll obviously be going well ahead of where we are today, but just listen to a few verses out of chapter 24 in Luke. Luke 24:44. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You see, it wasn't even until after the resurrection, at the very end of this Gospel, that Jesus shows up and then opens their minds and says, Now let me explain to you how all of this fits together and how it was all meant to be. And then they understood it. So he's planting seeds now knowing they won't understand it so that he can draw upon it later. Isn't it amazing how God can use his word in so many marvelous ways to plant seeds now, even as you get some level of understanding. But later on, the full understanding comes to bear when he's ready for it, when when you're ready for it. But for now, the meaning is hidden and the disciples move on to a new thought. Look at Luke 9, verse 46. An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to him, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. Now, as the text presents it here, this discussion, like the previous one, seems to kind of come up in the midst of of what we've already read, right? It's it's as, as if we have this interruption in the flow of thought from what's being taught in Luke 9. But as usual, if you do a careful comparison between the Gospels, you get the the additional understanding you need to piece it together. Mark 9.33, in this case, says this, They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. So what Mark gives us here in this additional detail is the fact that this discussion actually came up at a later point. So it's not as though they're in this moment in the midst of the boy being healed and the transfiguration just having happened and all of a sudden the disciples launch into a discussion of who's the greatest. 
That would have been quite awkward, and that's not how it transpired, more than likely. It was a later conversation as they moved out of that uh, place and went back to Capernaum. Now, it's interesting, though, that Luke has chosen to place it here, though. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, if it did happen the way Mark presented it, you still have the question of why did Luke place it here in this account? Why at this moment? In fact, as I read the Gospels, there seems to be two separate times in which the disciples engaged in a discussion of who is the greatest. This time and a previous time. We have this discussion, and then in chapter 22 of Luke, it comes up again in the midst of the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, the disciples have exactly the same argument a second time. Apparently, they were hungry for status and authority, and they must have sensed that this thought was at least immodest and probably disrespectful to the teacher, which is why when he asked them about it on the road, none of them would answer him. They must have recognized it was probably not smart. Kids do this, right? You ask them about something they know they did wrong, they just clam up. And that's basically what they've done here. As Mark explains it, they were even a little embarrassed. Now, as I said, there's two issues, two issues going on here in this questioning and in this discussion. There's two issues at play in the fact that the disciples are engaged in this conversation. One issue is in view here. The other issue becomes the central concern for the second account in Luke 22. It's uh, interesting, just as it happens, that the teaching I did in a, near Atlanta two weeks ago happened to be on these very verses, but out of Luke 22. So, if you'd like to understand what the second piece of understanding is connected with this teaching, I encourage you to get a copy of what I taught in Atlanta uh, out of Luke 22. But for now, we're only going to consider one here in these verses, and we're going to wait until we get to Luke 22 to look at the second issue. So if you want a a preview, you can go get the teaching I did from two weeks ago. But for today, let's look at what we find just in these verses here. The disciples are arguing about who is going to get to lead. Now, that's the first thing to understand here. The word greatest here is not being used in the sense of who's going to be the best teacher, the most Christ-like disciple. Okay, Not, not best in the in the greatest or the best sense of that word, but best in the sense of who is going to achieve the most. Who's going to have the greatest success, but in a kind of worldly sense. Who's going to look most successful is the the context here. More importantly, it's a context of a rabbi and his students. I want you to get a sense here of what the Jewish culture would have expected in that day. A rabbi like Jesus calls men to himself as students who learn under him for a period of time, and at the point where they're ready to move out from underneath that teaching, they follow in the steps of their teacher. So they become the rabbi for some group of students. And on it goes. That's the pattern of their culture. That's what these disciples are assuming they've signed up for. They're the the hand-picked students of a rabbi. And when they start arguing about who's going to be the greatest, they want to know who's going to be the greatest rabbi from among the students collected under Jesus. Who is going to be the one who ends up selecting his own students and teaches them and does as Jesus does in the best way, with the greatest reputation? Part of the problem here for the disciples is not just the arrogance and the pride of this discussion, but the fact that it reveals a complete lack of appreciation for what Jesus is preparing them for. You see the problem? It's not just that they're being arrogant and prideful. It's that they've got a completely different perspective on what it is greatest means in this moment. And you can see that when you look at what Jesus says to them in response. He brings this young child to him, and he uses the child as an example. He says that the one who is willing to receive a child, and by that, here's what he means by that. Receive a child in the sense of accept a child as one of his students, as one of his followers, when they were to move on into the role of teacher, who are they going to collect to themselves? Well, anyone who is willing to receive a child into the role of student would be the greatest. Because when you accepted the child, Christ said, you'd be accepting Jesus himself and therefore the Father. Now, why is this such a significant rebuke on the part of Christ? Well, you have to get into their culture for just a moment. The child in that culture was the least significant member of society. They had the least status and the least worth. Now imagine a disciple. Put yourself in the mind of, let's say, Peter, being a naturally prideful man, as Scripture reveals him to be. You're Peter. And you have an interest in being known as a a good student, but more importantly, you want to move on, graduate on to the role of rabbi like Christ, like Jesus. And you want to be the greatest rabbi. You want to be the most successful of his students. 
So what is it you imagine you would do as a rabbi to show your success? Well, in that culture, it came down to who you could pick who would be willing to follow you. The more status your students have, the more status that the teacher has. And if you were a very, very good, prominent teacher, one with a lot of respect, anyone you invited to be your student, you would probably have respond with a yes because of the honor implied by that offer. And so as the greatest rabbi, you'd be hand-picking very selectively only the best students, only those who have the, can offer you the greatest honor for having been your student. And you would expect as a great rabbi that you could command anybody's interest in being a student much as Jesus was now able to do. Their pride is in part built up on the fact that they feel very uh, selected to be Jesus' disciples, to be one of his select few. And so Christ turns to them and says, if you want to be the greatest, you need to go out and receive children as your students. That's almost making a mockery of them. In the sense of how little a student, a child would be worth, that's like making fun of them of saying that the greatest rabbi will be the one who can get nothing more than children to follow him around all day. Think about the image that's provoking in their mind. How you would just be a laughing stock if, as a rabbi, the only students you could command to yourself were a bunch of children. And that's what he's saying you have to be willing to do if you're going to be considered greatest. A rabbi who accepted and received children as his students in the world's sense, would be considered a laughingstock. But in Jesus' sense of what ministry was about, it would be the greatest thing you could do. While the disciples are busy trying to decide who's going to be the greatest teacher, who's going to have the greatest following, Jesus is cutting them down to size by saying the one who would be willing and content to have a following of children would be the greatest. And there's even more going on here, frankly. Probably more than even the disciples understood in the moment. Because his comment about children is more significant than merely a jab at their pride. In a very real sense, these men are going to attract a following of children. When they eventually go out in ministry after Christ's death, they are truly, in a spiritual sense, going to attract children. In Matthew's account, we can see what Jesus implies when he says this, Matthew 18.3, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. What Matthew included in his account was the detail that the disciples were in fact going to attract children, men and women who were born again, like children, in a spiritual sense, made soft-hearted, willing to confess their unworthiness before God, becoming humble, obedient, recognizing they have nothing of value to offer, just like a child. Value in terms of what God is looking for. And like a child dependent on his parents, they have to be willing to rely on the grace of God for the gift of eternal life. It's the salvation process. It is like a child coming to God. Humble, with nothing to offer, born again, if it, as, you, as the Scripture says. That would be the mark of a faithful believer. And this, my friends, is a radical departure from what their culture said pious godliness looked like. What was piousness in their culture? What was godliness? It was pride. It was haughtiness. It was the Pharisee, the Sadducee, who could walk around and say, look how much I've achieved in my holiness. Look how well I can keep the law. It was a complete opposite from what he just described faithful believers would look like. Humble, with nothing to offer, nothing of their own merit to fall back on. And he's working hard here to refashion the minds of the disciples about what it means to be a good follower. Good follower, when you become the leader, you're looking for the children, the lowest in society, those who have humbled themselves and have nothing to offer and no, and no misunderstanding about that in their own heart. And you have to be willing to collect and, 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 and bring those kind of people along and base your ministry on those kind of people. If you're going to try to collect the proud, haughty, self-made, self-righteous men that that world knew so well, and call them your students and believe you're building the kingdom with them, you have no idea what you're doing. It's a completely false view. The beginning of Jesus' final preparation for the disciples to become ambassadors of the gospel begins in chapter 10. Chapter 1 through 9, which we're now getting ready to finish, is the ministry of Jesus in the Galilee, as Luke tells it. 
From chapter 10 onward, things change dramatically in this gospel. From 10 onward, Christ is single-focused. He withdraws his offer for the gospel to the nation of Israel. They have rejected him, and we'll see that in chapter 11. And from then on, he moves directly toward a one-way road to Jerusalem and prepares the disciples as he moves toward Jerusalem for his death and for their ministry afterward. And so the, the fundamental shift that's about to occur in the gospel is being reflected even now in this little bit of foreboding as Christ begins to talk about his death and as he begins to talk about who they're going to collect after him and what it looks like. He's already spent three years with these men. He's on the verge, as I said, of withdrawing the offer of the kingdom to the Jewish nation. And he still has men who are thinking like the world about what it is to be in ministry. Let's look, for example, at the next series of verses as you get an insight here into some of the misthinking that is still driving the disciples. In Luke 9:49, John answered. John responded to Jesus' example about the children. And he said this, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. And Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. On the heels of what he had just said a moment ago about how they had to be prepared to be the least in the world rather than the best, to collect children to them, John's response to that is to complain that there's others already attempting to work in his name, but they're not one of the disciples. They're not one of these that Jesus has collected to him. Go back to what we said a moment ago about the the mindset of a rabbi. Only those I call and select have the right to be considered one of my students. And we have men out there now claiming to do the work you want us to do, but they're not one of your disciples. We tried to stop them, couldn't do it. And Jesus tells them, basically, get over it. You know, forget about that, John. Get over it. They're on your team. You need to break this thinking that says that it's an exclusive club to be one of my followers. That you have to earn the privilege to kind of be accepted and received into this club. And only the best get picked or some nonsense like that. Those who are working toward the same goals are on your side. Don't oppose them. At first, I would argue that John's comment looks very selfish, even childish, and maybe even petty. But we need to remember the disciples are simply working from the understanding that's built up over years of living in that culture. Rabbis, as I said, they they cultivate their own sex sometimes within the Jewish faith. They have their own following. It's a little club. And when someone claimed to be a disciple, but they hadn't been invited into that club, it was an offense against those who had been selected. Think of it like this. You've won the Masters Golf Tournament in Augusta, Georgia. And if you know anything about golf, you get to wear the green jacket. You get to be a permanent member of that exclusive, private, members-only club in Augusta, Georgia. You have a lifetime membership after you win the Masters. You have your own name on a locker in that very exclusive club. And one day you see somebody make their own green jacket and they put it on and they walk out onto the course and they try to play golf on your exclusive club with the jacket they made for themselves. What would you think? You know, if you think like the world, you'd be incensed. You'd demand that that person be removed from your club, that they have that jacket destroyed, that they are impersonating a Masters champion. That's, that's heresy for a Masters champion. And that's exactly what John is doing here. Essentially, he's complaining that they had had the high privilege of being selected by Jesus to be one of his followers, and here's this nobody out there pretending to be a follower of Jesus, trying to act as if he's already been invited into the club, and he never earned it. And the disciples have got to come to an understanding sooner or later that this isn't an exclusive club. This isn't something that you only get in uh, because of your merit. It's a club of misfits. And God is the one who determines membership. Look at what Jesus says in the next chapter as I end today. Chapter 10 of Luke, verse 21, if you flip a page or two. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father... Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. The kingdom is going to be populated by those who are not honored, who are not esteemed, generally speaking, who are not worthy by the world's standards. It's not going to be populated, we're told by Paul, by those who are wise and mighty, the ones the world honors. Generally speaking, it's going to be populated by the spiritual children of this world. 
the unworthy, the humble, the meek. And the disciples are just beginning, if at all, to understand that here, about what it's going to take to build the kingdom. And Jesus is teaching the apostles to see all those who work for the same goal as already having been made a part of the family, the family of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they don't need to approve them. God approved them. He appointed them. They just have to recognize who they are and work with them. We all come into the family of God by God's grace, by His mercy. And when God has touched our lives with the Holy Spirit and brought us into the family of God and we see that evident in somebody else's life, we receive them as a brother or a sister in the Lord. We don't demand that they pass some test. Ultimately, time will tell their heart. And that's the discernment that brothers and sisters bring to one another over time. But we bring them in initially based on who they say they are and what they say they believe. And we let God deal with the rest. As we end today, I want to remind you that as we go through the Gospel, now looking at chapters 10 and beyond, we're going to see a shift. We're going to see a shift in the way Jesus approaches His ministry because the nation of Israel in chapter 10 and in particularly chapter 11 will formally reject this offer of the Messiah. They will take their look at Jesus, hear His words, see His proof, and decide that, no, He's not the Messiah. He is, in fact, Satan himself. And in that declaration, they make unavailable the offer of the kingdom. It is withdrawn from them. And as we go out of here, in our ministry to the city of San Antonio, to wherever God places us in this small corner of the world we live, consider this. We are like the disciples in many ways. And in particular, we are the ones through whom God wants to bring this message that there is a limited opportunity. There is a window of opening for people to be a member of this family of God as God gives opportunity. He may be doing it through us in that moment. He may be doing it at a later time and we're simply planting a seed. But there's only so long. Because inevitably death comes and at death that opportunity, if it hasn't already been removed, is gone for sure. And just like the nation of Israel had an opportunity that they let pass by, we should always be thinking about those we run into on a daily basis. Who is getting an opportunity through me right now for the one and only time? And am I doing my part as God gives me opportunity to bring that message and to make the urgency of it part of the message? Not to scare people for the sake of scaring them, but to make sure they understand the consequences of their decision and for us as well. Let's go to prayer. Let's ask for the Lord to give us opportunity in this week to come to make exactly that kind of presentation of the gospel. And let's ask Him for the joy of seeing the Holy Spirit work in that moment. Father, we are thankful, as always, for this time to know the Gospel message is so true and so real. How easy, Father, is it for us to forget that the disciples were just like us. They were not men with special talents. They were not men, Father, with a special strength of faith. Though at one day in their lives they reached that point, they started like we all start. Father, we pray that we might remember them and their rough start and their misunderstandings so that when we are in the same place, we will not lose our hope. We will not lose our desire to serve you. We would never turn and think that because we are not all that Paul was or all that Peter was in their finer moments, that somehow we are unqualified for the task you've put before us because in so many days they were just like us. They were weak in their faith. They were unsure in their understanding of Scripture. They were busy in their lives, fishing or tent making. But then you called them, Father, and you called them to do so much more for the glory of God and for the kingdom. And they responded in their weakness. And in their weakness, Father, your strength was made evident. Let us know that our weaknesses, Father, are the things you desire to work through for your own glory, that our Opportunities, Father, are presented for our benefit, not because you can't work without us, but because you desire to work through us. Let us be attentive to the message that you've taught us today. Let us consider ways to put it to use. Be ready, Father, at all times to present the gospel to anyone you put in our path. Let our witness, Father, be that message itself. Let our very lives reflect you. And let us always be thankful, Father, that we do get the opportunity to come back here weekly and be built up in the faith, by the power of your word, to be made ready again to go out into the world and to do your work. 
Thank you for that time this morning. I pray, Lord, it would come again in a week and that as many as you would draw would come. And we would all be here together if it be your will. And in all we do, Father, let us give you glory and thanks and praise for you are good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.